When I was in the second grade, I struggled to understand how long subtraction worked. When asked to subtract 53 from 1,000, I struggled to understand how to take from the thousands place to give to the hundredths, the tens, finally the ones, so that I'd be subtracting 3 from 10 and 5 from 9, leaving me with 947. And the reason that I struggled this was I wasn't conceptualizing why it was necessary to cross off certain digits and which zeros turn to nines and which to tens. Until one day when a teacher of mine presented it, presented it to me in terms of fruit. So let's say I'm subtracting 12 from 811. And it's like I'm going to the farmer's market to buy 12 watermelons. Well, I know that a farmer's market stand probably won't have 12 watermelons ready for me. So I just ask for two. And they only have one. So they have to request an order of 10 from their supplier. So that gives them 11 minus my two would leave nine. And then I go to the supplier to get my own bulk order of 10 when they just gave their last one to the market stand. And so they have to request a shipment of 10 orders of 10 from the farm. And that would give them 10 minus my one leaves nine. And then the farm only had eight. So now they have seven. Now I know that this is kind of confusing in the way that I'm presenting it, but to a second grader who was approaching these problems for the first time, it made a lot more sense to start with fruit than starting with just numbers. By relating a simple anecdote about fruit to long subtraction problems, I was better able to conceptualize why it was necessary to cross off certain digits and replace them with others. Now, I know what you're thinking. This is most definitely an elementary level example. And so this is going to be a talk about things that probably only apply to elementary level concepts. But what I'm here to convince you is that by relating difficult to understand ideas to familiar and, and relative ide concepts, we can better understand the confusing world around us. Now, I certainly don't claim to be an expert on this topic. I'm not a pre-MAE student. I haven't taken any education classes. I have, however, tutored dozens of students. And I hope that through some of my experiences, we can come to learn more about the perspective from which we can teach ourselves and others about the confusing world around us, while also learning how to better communicate our own perspectives and opinions. Let's start with an example. In the fall semester of 2018, I was tutoring a student in Chemistry 129, which is an introductory level chemistry course here at Truman. And we'd meet once a week and go through old quizzes, and, and we'd go through problems that the student didn't really get right, and try to figure out where they were struggling. And I tried to improve not only their performance in this course, but also to improve their understanding of the material so that they could, they could perform better in future chemistry courses as well. So we come to the end of the semester, and we're approached with a problem like the one seen here. So 12 grams of sodium hydroxide is dissolved in enough water to make a half a liter of solution. And 20 grams of magnesium chloride are dissolved in 750 milliliters. If I combine 50 milliliters of each of these, how many grams of magnesium hydroxide would precipitate out of solution? Now, as my student approached this problem, she knew that she'd have to take those masses and convert them to concentrations and then somehow get those to a massive final product. But she didn't really know where to start or even really where to go from there. And the problem was she wasn't fully conceptualizing why it was necessary to make these conversions in the first place. As I talked further with her, I recognized that the issue was not just this problem. It's that she didn't fully understand the idea of stoichiometry in general. Now, for those of you who have taken an introductory level chemistry course, you've probably heard that word before. But stoichiometry, it's just a big fancy word. And all it means is how much stuff can I make with how much stuff I have. It's an idea that goes back to balancing chemical equations and moles and et cetera. So as much as I want to, I don't plan on turning this into a chemistry lecture. But for clarity's sake, I provide the following chemical equation. And as I walked through balancing this equation with her, maybe, and I put those molar coefficients in there, I recognized that she knew how to do it. She knew what she was doing. She knew how to put those numbers on the paper. She just didn't fully understand why it was necessary to put those numbers there. there. Now, this is a problem for a lot of students in introductory level courses. It's that they know what to do, and they know how to do it. They're just not fully sure why they have to do it, which is fine. You, know, you can do that, and you can pass exams and pass a class by just doing things without understanding exactly why. But when I, concepts like this are applied later on to more advanced topics like analytical chemistry or, or titration curves, when the math suddenly becomes logarithmic and things are only more complicated, things get a lot more convoluted. So I knew I had to take a different approach in teaching this student. I told her to imagine, instead of reacting sodium hydroxide and magnesium chloride, instead, she was making peanut butter sandwiches. 
Now, the recipe for a peanut butter sandwich is just two slices of bread, Sara Lee honey wheat, of course, and then one tablespoon of Jif peanut butter, and that gives you a peanut butter sandwich, and then a happy Caleb, obviously. So let's just say that I give you a loaf of bread, and it has 18 slices. And I give you a jar of peanut butter, and it has 16 tablespoons. And I ask you, how many peanut butter sandwiches can you make? Well, with the recipe that I gave you, you should be able to quickly recognize that you have far more peanut butter than bread, and so you should take those 18 slices that I gave you and divide it by the two necessary to make one sandwich, and you have nine sandwiches. And then if I ask you, how much peanut butter do you have left over? Well, you should take the nine tablespoons required to make the nine sandwiches you just made, subtract that from the 16 you started with, and you have seven tablespoons left over. This is the basics of stoichiometry. As I walked my student through this example, I watched her eyes light up as she finally understood why she had to put those molar coefficients in there in the first place, why it was necessary to balance chemical equations, what a mole actually was, why Avogadro's number is so important, so many different things. This is a moment that sticks with me, and it's one of the reasons why I want to teach people chemistry. Too often, students find themselves in a situation where information is being regurgitated at them at a mile a minute, and they're required to take notes as fast as they can and, and then memorize those notes so that they can just re-regurgitate that information back onto their exams rather than taking the time to actually learn what's going on in class. Now, this is obviously not to the fault of professors, as they're often asked to teach an infinite amount of information in a definite amount of time. However, if we can find a way to teach information in a way that's clear and understood, things can become a lot easier. I want to demonstrate this through another means. Ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid, known more commonly by its deprotonated form, ethylene diamine tetraacetate, is a very, very common chelating agent. It's a hexadentate ligand, and its four formal charges on the four acetate groups, as well as the two lone pairs on the amines, makes it very, very useful. Its, its chelation is extremely favorable with the free rotation around the sigma bonds, which makes it really, really useful in things like analytical environmental chemistry and determining the concentration of heavy metals. Um, it's really good at inhibiting metal ions from chelating with pigments in the textile industry, as we all know that pigments are just big, chel big chelators themselves. And it can also be used as a food additive, as it can be used um, as an antioxidant sometimes. Are you guys still following? I didn't think so. This is how this information on EDTA would likely be presented in a classroom setting, or even written in a textbook. To understand what I'm talking about, you probably have to have some prior knowledge of chemistry. You'd have to understand vocabulary words such as chelate, ligand, hexadentate, etc. This is one of the key limitations of the English language. It's that, unfortunately, we don't all know what every single word means. A friend of mine uh, posed the idea that language is ironically the greatest barrier to our communication. So, although we don't all speak chemistry, we do share one common language, and that's fun. So, I'm going to demonstrate this through another means. I have a different drawing of EDTA on the screen, and what I want you to notice from this drawing is those black dots. Those big black dots just represent electrons, and electrons are negatively charged particles. So, if you see a black dot, just think negative charge density. Okay, stick with me for a moment, but imagine that my body is an EDTA molecule. And so you have that central carbon chain, that ethylene group right there, that's going to be my torso right here. Okay, does that make sense? Is everyone following? Okay, cool, because it's about to pick up. And then I have these two nitrogens, those two amines, that's going to be represented by my head and then the lower part of my torso. And recognize that there's lone pairs on there, so I have negative charge density around my head and around the lower part of my torso. And then I have these four acetate groups with those oxygens, and those oxygens have a lot of dots around them. So there's a lot of negative charge density. There's formal charges on those, on those acetate groups. So lots of negative charge density here on my arms and my legs, and then lots of negative charge density on my head and the lower part of my torso. So when a positively charged metal ion is introduced to solution, well, there's a positive charge, and I have a lot of negative charge, and I have a lot of free rotation, and I'm a big lanky molecule that can do a lot of things, right? And so the negative charges on my body are going to be attracted to the positive charges of that ion, right? And so, well, I have to get the negative charge as close to that positive charge as possible, right? So I have to fold in. Now, they told me not to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway, because I only get to do this once, okay? But if there's a positive charge in solution, what am I going to do? I'm going to chelate that metal ion, 
So you get a chelation coordination that looks something like this, where that metal ion is completely surrounded by negative charge from that EDTA molecule. Does that make sense? How much more likely are you to remember the, the EDTA chelation coordination when I roll around on the stage and act like a buffoon versus when I use a bunch of big fancy words and I slap a couple of figures on the screen? Hopefully a lot more likely. This can be applied to all sorts of concepts, like giving emotions to carbons so that we can understand more stable substitution patterns or even describe Markovnikov's rule. But how does this apply outside of the chemistry world? Why would I take the time to get up here on stage and roll around and tell you guys how you should teach people about chemistry when most of you are not chemists? I want you to think about the last time you went to the doctor's office and you got a, a report or a diagnosis and you, thought, you, sat there to, you sat there thinking to yourself, what is this person saying? Are they even speaking English? You know, why do doctors have to use such big words to describe what's going on in your body, right? This has actually become a very noticeable issue in the scientific community. So much so that Alan Alda, known for his involvement in the TV show MASH, and more recently in West Wing, created the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science in 2009 for this very reason. He noticed that when he went to a foreign country to receive the same medical report, he was better able to understand the foreign doctor than if he were to receive that report from an American doctor. This was likely due to language barriers forcing more simpler terms to be used. He says in his mission statement for the center, effective science communication happens when we listen and connect. It happens when we use empathy. Communication is headed for success when we pay more attention to what the other person is understanding rather than focusing solely on what we want to say. But this issue of, of, of struggling to communicate effectively is not just unique to the scientific community. I want you to think about the last time you got in a fight with a friend and you knew that you were 100% correct. But your friend also knew that they were 100% correct. But you knew that your 100% correct was more than their 100% correct. And so rather than communicating well and trying to solve the issue at hand, instead, you just tried to use bigger words to outsmart your friend or oversimplify their argument to prove that it's fallible to one specific niche situation. Think about it. Our country is fueled by the anger-driven media and politics, where rather than solving the issues that are plaguing our country, instead, we just try to prove that the other side of the aisle's argument is fallible. So how can we change this? How do we change the rhetoric so that communication is more effective? I don't know if you guys realize this, but some of the stuff that I've been talking about up here related to chemistry is upper level chemistry. Things that you probably wouldn't, wouldn't encounter until at least a 200 level course. And I hope that you've been following a little bit at least. So how can a psychologist describe neurological developments to a musician? How can an economist describe the latest stock trends to a medical doctor? How can you present your argument with your friend in a way so that both sides are clear and heard so that we can solve the issue at hand? These are difficult questions to answer, but I hope they have something to do with empathy. If we take the time to relate our ideas, our knowledge, opinions, facts, perspectives, to simple, relatable, creative, fun ideas. We can break the barrier that language creates in our communication. How can you be the best empathetic communicator you can be? How can you teach chemistry with peanut butter sandwiches? Thank you. <laughs>